Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to a little poem, Spirit, that formed this scene. Poem number 20 of the 22 of From Noon to Starry Night. Obviously we're coming to the end. Um, this is going to be a powerful little poem where Whitman is trying to respond to some of his critics. He will be celebrating uh, the power of nature, especially in the West. You'll remember that we said about Whitman's biography that he took one trip out West out here, and it was in September of 1879. And he's going to have uh, an, uh, only a handful of reflections. You'll remember Prairie States and Italian Music and Dakotas uh, as two other poems that will reference uh, this trip as well. Now, um, it's interesting when he uses the word spirit. Is he talking about God? Is he talking about some kind of energy? Is he talking about some kind of Emersonian um, 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 understanding of nature? This is always going to be part of the debate. However, think of it this way. If Whitman said he was trying to create a new American Bible, then clearly he's going to play around with the Christian ideas of Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So here, we'll get to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Technically, what we're really going to play with is the idea of inspiration, poetic inspiration, um, and, and the genius of this poem, its construction, is quite remarkable, uh, as we'll get into it. Now, our assumptions that you've been with us at LearnStrong.net, down that left-hand side, talks with Waldar Playlist, and that you've been with us from the very beginning, we've, we're, we're going to make some comments to those very in, uh, early poems and inscriptions. We gave a set of introductory comments to Starry Night, and we just uh, finished with what best I see. Now our Nortons will tell us about this poem that it first appeared in Leaves of Grass 1881 and in the critics September 10th of the same year a memory of Whitman's western trip in 1879 as we said September. It may be compared with its prose counterpart an egotistical find in Specimen Days where he actually said I have found the law of my own poems, speaking of the West, and of course the power of the nature of the West. Um, and, and, uh, and when we look at this poem, we will see his attempt to try to explain that power and then to try to address his critics, as he's done obviously several times in Leaves of Grass. You'll remember into the old cause merged into uh, um, it, merged with spirit. Um, we will play that. That's the very first time that the word spirit gets used in Leaves of Grass. Notice the subtitle here, written in Platte Canyon, Colorado, obviously somewhat close to us out here in Wyoming. Notice how the rhythms of this poem, and notice how the first line and the last line will balance this, this little offering. Spirit that formed this scene, these tumbled rock piles grim and red, these reckless heaven ambitious peaks, these gorgeous turbulent clear streams, this naked freshness, these formless wild arrays for reasons of their own. I know thee, savage spirit. We have communed together, mine too, such wild arrays, for reasons of their own. Was it charged against my chance? They had forgotten art to fuse within themselves its rules, precise and delicaties, the lyrics measured beat, the wrought out temple's grace, column and polished arch forgot. But thou that revealest here, spirit that for this scene, they have remembered thee. Now, again, if you're asking Whitman to explain the poetic inspiration, he will say that it really in the end is about the West. And to what degree is that true? Well, it's a certain kind of Promethean spirit. Can we call it that? That radical, rebellious spirit that Whitman enjoys. Notice right away the words that will get used to try to play that game. You'll have four of the uh, of, of in a row these. Again, the idea of forming and spirit. Whitman's readers, now not so much readers today necessarily, but Whitman's readers would immediately go to the first seven or eight or nine verses of Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the spirit moved upon the waters. And this idea of the spirit forming or creating this idea of Genesis or cosmogonic stories will be central to this poem. Notice he'll talk about tumbled rock piles, grim and red. It, 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 now, this word grim is an interesting word. In other words, pristine would be his understanding, I think, of the word grim. By the way, tumbled gets used one time, and it's right here. These reckless, heaven-ambitious peaks, um, again, uh, you'll, reckless gets used six times in Leaves of Grass. Whitman likes this word. 
the, the mountains, and, and of course, we, we're familiar with this, living ourselves in the Bighorns, aren't we? These gorges, turbulent, clear streams, this naked freshness, and again, naked here is, again, pristine, right? In other words, unadulterated, pure, if you will. These formless, wild arrays, and then the use of the word wild to take us to savage in a bed, and then he'll say, for reasons of their own. Now there's his theodicy. In other words, what's all this in nature for? Well, like, there's, it's their own explanation. Don't try and read too much into why. Just appreciate this is the way it is. Now, if he stops here, this is nothing more than a celebration of what we get to see all the time out here in the West. But then he switches and he says, I know thee. Now this idea of knowledge and the way in which he's experienced this savage spirit, as he will call it, is central to our reading of Lisa Grass, which is, I think, why it's sitting here at this point in From Noon to Starry Night. In other words, he's beginning to recognize the source of his noon as he moves, obviously, towards his night. I know these savage spirits. Notice the use of the dash. I know these savage spirits. We have communed together. Now, his use of the word commune, I find this fascinating. It is a obviously very religious term. It is a Christian religious term. It's used one time in Leaves of Grass, and it's right here, right now. We have communed together. Mine, too. By the way, if you go back and look at um, um, uh, Wordsworth's Ten Turn Abbey and our comments at LearnStrong.net, you will see the same idea of communal, this idea of, of coming together with nature. Mine, too. In other words, his production, his poems. Mine, too, such wild arrays for reasons of their own. In other words, here's his theodicy. I have my own reasons for the writing of these poems, and they're very similar to the spirit that created all of this amazing nature. And then he'll ask three rhetorical questions. Was it charged? Oh, of course, this will take us back to, I hear it was charged uh, uh, against me, right? Was it charged against my chance? Notice he calls them chance here, not songs or poems. They had forgotten art. In other words, there's something wrong with Whitman's poetry often critiqued, as we've said. I mean, people saw Longfellow's Psalm of Life, Tell Me Not, in Mournful Numbers, Life is But an Empty Dream is what poetry actually is. This isn't real art. This, I mean, anybody could write this. Many people argued about Whitman. Notice he will say about his work that the goal is to fuse within themselves. This word fuse will take us back to for him I sing. To fuse within themselves its rules, precise and delicate ease. Um, you'll remember delicacies from nor youth pertains to me. In other words, am I? He, he's making this effeminate view that most poetry of his day is kind of like rule-bound, silly, delicate delicacies. The lyricist, one, one last question, the lyricist measure B. I think this takes us back now to Song of Myself 4647. That is to say, um, I know I have the best of time and space. I was never measured and never will be measured. Notice here, he says, the, the poetry of today are lyrics that are measured, the wrought out temples grace. Now we've heard about cathedrals and we've heard about temples and leaves of grass and notice wrought out here meaning empty, shell-like, if you will. He says, column, notice the dash, column and polished arch for God. In other words, the poetry of his day, he's critiquing, right? Longfellow and other poets of his own day. It's all shiny and polished, but it's useless. There's nothing inside. That is to say, can we say this? There's no spirit. There's nothing that moves. It is a fair question to ask. What is it now that we're here and we're beginning to end now our study of Leaves of Grass? What is it about these poems that moves the reader, that moves us? One argument Whitman makes is there's a spirit that imbibes this kind of poetry that is lacking in other poems, right? Uh, and then he'll finish his response now to these three rhetorical questions and to those who would charge against him that his poetry is not legitimate. But thou that, re thou that revealest here, this again, the spirit, spirit that form this scene, they, his poems, his chants, have remembered the. Now, I think the, word, the key word in this poem is remembered. I think this is what Whitman is trying to argue throughout Leaves of Grass, that 
You have to remember the only sin is to forget, as we have said. Whitman often will make a similar kind of idea, argument, that we can't forget. We can't forget, of course, politically, and here inspirationally, we cannot forget. Well, I think at 2A, his argument is that nature is the best inspiration, and that puts him, of course, in the British Romantic tradition of lyrical ballads in Wordsworth and Coleridge. It puts him, obviously, in the transcendental or the idealist position of Immanuel Kant, and obviously Emerson and Thoreau as well as, as Emily Dickinson. At 2B, notice the line construction. It goes from short to long to short. There's artistry here. Notice that the first and the last line are identical in their rhythm and in their alliteration, while those middle lines play around with the basic 3B line. It's fascinating. Go back and study it closer on your own. At 3A, obviously, we're going to throw Emerson's nature that we've given full lectures on, all of Emerson's major essays at LearnStrong.net, but certainly this one as well as obviously Sir Rose Walden does come to mind. I want to point out, though, that the poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins is, uh, is an important addition here. Go back to our comments about spring and fall and notice how he plays around with rhythm. He made the observation of the power of this savage, savage uh, artistry. Um, and, and I think uh, over time, after, after uh, Leaves of Grass was finally published in its last iteration, people have been able to appreciate the artistry, and I am hopeful that in our talks with Walt, we've been able to demonstrate that. Finally, in 3B, to just make this personal now, to own a poem like this, what spirit moves you, in, especially in, in terms of inspiration? What is it that inspires you? And I hope our reading of Leaves of Grass continues to inspire you to create your own poetry. Thank you.